All right, everybody, we're here talking about budget reconciliation and what's going on in the House and Senate. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Just kidding. We're in the wrong show. You're in the green room, and we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of different topics with some reverse intros. We're going to go with uh, Billy on uh, and Brian. Where are you calling in from? What are you talking about today? Hi, Billy Ann. I'm calling in from London today. And with Brian, we'll be talking about how companies can deliver above market growth using what we call the growth triple play, a combination of creativity, analytics, and purpose. Very cool. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Solis. I'm the global innovation evangelist at Salesforce and a colleague in front of uh, Bala and longtime friend of Ray. Uh, I will be also talking about the, the, the growth triple play and some of the work that we've been doing to help uh, CMOs and chief growth officers uh, reimagine the future of their business by driving growth through meaningful engagement. Awesome. Awesome. I got Praveen. Where are you calling from? What are you talking about? Hey guys, uh, good afternoon. Good, good morning, all. Uh, my name is Praveen Moturu. I uh, work as a vice president and uh, chief enterprise architect for Mars. Uh, most of you know, have known uh, Mars as a candy company, Mars bars, Skittles, M&Ms, you know, but we are big into Mars pet care and how we help uh, a better life for pets. We're going to talk more about it, but primarily I'll be talking about how enterprise architecture is driving digital transformation, digital disruptions and uh, driving new business models as we evolve. Thank you. Very, very cool. I've got James here. Uh, where are you calling in from? What are we talking about? Uh, uh, it's James Altucher. I'm calling in from Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm going to be, so I, I'm an entrepreneur, an investor, a writer. I've written a bunch of books. And I'm going to be talking about how in this period where a year ago, 55 million people were laid off and everybody started wondering, maybe I should start doing what I love, how you can be quickly among the best in whatever is your passion, no matter what your age and how you could potentially monetize it so that you could continue to enjoy doing what you love. Very, very cool. We're going to come to you next soon. And uh, let's go. We'll start the show. I'll do the honors and we'll run the countdown. All right. Three, two, one. Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us on Disrupt TV. My name is Vala Afshar. I'm the chief digital evangelist at Salesforce and your co-host for the next hour. We welcome you to follow us on Twitter at Disrupt TV Show. Send Ray, myself, our guests, your questions live using hashtag Disrupt TV, and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. It's my pleasure to introduce my co-host. He's Ray Wong, CEO and founder of Constellation Research, best-selling author of Everybody Wants to Rule the World, Surviving and Thriving in a World of Digital Giants. Ray's a regular television and technology business contributor on Fox Business, Yahoo Finance, CNBC, and Wall Street Journal. In my opinion, he's one of the top futurists to follow on Twitter at RWANG0. Welcome, Ray, to Disrupt TV. Hey, thanks a lot. I'm here with the awesome co-founder, co-host, Bala Ashtar. He's the chief digital evangelist of Salesforce, and also he's the author of The Pursuit of Social Business Excellence. If you don't know him yet, you've probably seen him. Executives around the world pay attention to every one of his inspirational, insightful tweets, and more importantly, when he's not hosting or keynoting or leading events at Salesforce, you can find him on speaking on business TV outlets such as Bloomberg and, of course, posting insightful analyses here on ZDNet, especially about these shows. So who do we have today who we're kicking off with and what's going on? That's an honor for us to have James Altucher, who I've been following on Twitter for a decade. He's an entrepreneur, right. angel investor, best-selling author and founder of the James Altucher Show podcast, a must-listen to podcast. James has started and ran more than, uh, uh, more than 20 companies and is currently an investor and advisor to over 30 companies. The author of over 20 books, that's ridiculous, right? 20 books. James Works uh, has appeared on Wall Street Journal, best-selling list. Choose yourself as an example in USA Today list of best business books of all time. His new book is Skip the Line. In Skip the Line, James busts the 10,000-hour rule of achieving mastery, offering a new mindset and dozens of techniques that will inspire any professional, no matter their age or managerial level, level to pursue their passion and quickly acquire the skills they need to succeed and achieve their dreams. James is also a national chess master, and he's a fantastic follow on Twitter at J-A-L-T-U-C-H-E-R. Welcome, James, to the Shrub TV. You know, thanks for having me. And it's such a coincidence, Bala. We, we met like eight or nine years ago. And Ray, you were just on the pod, my podcast talking about your book, and you dropped such amazing knowledge. You really must have sources everywhere because it's one of the most listened to podcasts I've had this year. And so many people have been quoting what, what you've said. It, it was really fascinating talking to you. That's why I'm so happy that, that I'm here. I know both of you guys and so happy to be on your show. Thanks for inviting me. 
Thank you so hey, much. Hey, so humbled to have you here. So humbled and uh, to have be on your podcast. You know, we really want to say, take some time, talk about your awesome new book. Um, I think it breaks a lot of myths. I think it's super important. Um, what is Skip the Line? What is the genesis behind it? And of course, we'll get a picture of the book up here soon. So uh, sure. yeah, start with that. Yeah, I mean, there's really two different beginnings. One is that, like many people, through through um, my own makings or makings that were forced on me, I've had to switch careers many times and I've switched passions many times. Nobody's interested in one thing for their whole life. But sometimes, but often when I would become interested in something new, everybody around me would say, you can't, you're, you're 40 years old, you're 45, you're 50 years, you can't do that. Like you're too old. You should just do what you studied in school and stick to that. And often when people say you can't do that, it's they're the ones who can't do it. And they might mean it in a good natured way. They don't want you to be disappointed later, or they might be jealous if you do what you love doing. Like, let's say you've been an accountant all your life, but you really are interested in fantasy sports. Is it possible to really get, be great at fantasy sports at an older age? And, and is it possible to make money at it once you're great? And there are, are books and ideas that kind of cover one topic or the other, but nothing which sort of combines both. And again, through for better or for worse because i've gone broke many times as well i've often had to switch careers switch passions you know my first business i sold in the late 90s i made i made websites for entertainment companies i made a lot of money and then through poor investing i lost all of it this was over 20 years ago i had to really learn through the school of hard knocks what it's like to lose millions and then go completely broke and lose a home and i switched passions. Nobody, nobody wanted me then. And I had to kind of start over in a new career. And, and I, I've done this several times, many times. And every single time, it was always a common theme. People said, you can't do this, just stick to what you're good at. And I had to become good, and then learn how to monetize. And there's like a language of mastering a new skill. And there's a language of monetizing that new skill. Like people always say ideas are a dime a dozen execution is everything that may or may not be true but execution ideas are a subset of ideas you need creativity hmm. to be good at executing to be good at monetizing it doesn't just money doesn't just fall down on you once you're good at something so they're interwoven becoming good at a new skill and monetizing it so that's really what skip the lines about but then it coincided with again last year 55 million people got laid off from their jobs and people look back on their lives and they say listen i don't want to I think I had a break just now. I don't want to go back to my old life. I want to pursue the things that I, I I loved as a kid or I love now and and see if I can get good at it and see if I can make money at it. And I've seen a, just a lot of amazing stories of people who who have done that. I mean, and that's that's what the book is about. That's amazing. It's amazing. What I love about your writing and you're a prolific writer is it, your writing is raw. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's awesome. like radical transparency and raw. Like I read where you, you know, in a few in a couple of months or a number of months you drained your account from 15 million dollars to 143 dollars uh, and you talk about how that felt and and, and, you, and, and and this book is not about hacks it's not about shortcuts it's about no. how you transform the way you think and live and work and through your throughout your writing even prior to the book you wrote about uh, learning chess and what chess taught you and you said it, it taught you how to learn uh, how to lose you were a poor loser at the beginning, you know, temper tantrums when you lost. This is young. You know, we're talking 17, 18 as a teenager. Uh, but but you learn from your losses. You start to care about, about getting better versus winning, which which you said it, it, that's how you went from an expert level to a master level. You learn how to play. It taught you how to control your paranoia, how to deal with adults. And a really profound statement, which was it taught, it, it taught you how to take advantage. When you love something, instant communities built around you to protect you. So when you wrote uh, right, Skip the Line, did you think about the importance of facing your fears and learning how to win and lose and, and taking advantage of the situation in terms of becoming that 1% uh, expert level? Uh, how did right. chess influence the writing Skip the Line? There's so much you said that to unpack there. And there's one thing actually you said that I guess I thought about it mentioned in the book, but it really comes to life for me more and more, which is that when you get really good at something and passionate about something and you start learning and, and progressing in it, 
a community does form around you. You hook up to a community and uh, that community exists all over the world. You know, if you play, I'll use chess as an example. I was in Buenos Aires. I didn't speak Spanish. I show up at the chess club, which incidentally is one of the most famous chess clubs in the world. A lot of famous matches occurred there and they were closed for the day. They didn't want to let me in. I knocked on the door. They didn't really understand me. And then I just described, you know, what my ranking was. And they're like, oh, you know, maestro, come right in. And the the, 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 Brazil, the Argentinian junior champion was there and we played a little blitz match and they gave me a tour of the place. And it was suddenly I felt part of this worldwide community and that happens everywhere. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm going to go to the club here later and, and meet some friends and that people I've known for decades. And so whether it's chess or entrepreneurship or investing or writing or stand-up comedy, there's subcultures around all of these things that really, you know, you, you find your peers and you're all, and you all love something and you're all improving together. Yeah. But yeah, from learning, from learning that as a young person, I realized there's a, like a meta language to learning, which is, you know, let's say you love something. You don't need to be, by the way, in the top 10 in the world to monetize something. People always say to me, oh, if you're in, if you play tennis, you've got to be in the top 50 if you want to make a living. Uh, otherwise you'll be like a tennis coach or whatever. But I think, I don't know if that's always been true or never been true, but, but certainly now in today's world, there are so many ways to make money, no matter what your interest is. Like I know people who are decent chess players, some better than me, some not as good as me who make over a million a year, for instance, on Twitch, you know, that's one Avenue. They just stream while they're playing and they talk about their games. I'm not, that's one Avenue in that particular domain, but whether you're interested in, you know, fantasy sports or golf or music or being an entrepreneur. There's so many different ways now and so many opportunities. Let's say you're a writer. It used to be the case that you had to, you, you would write a book and then an agent had to like it. And then a public, an editor had to like it. And then a publisher had to like it. And the marketing department had to like it. And Barnes and Noble had to like it. And then finally you could publish your book. That's very hard to do to get all these people to like what you do, but yeah. And you have to write the book first. Well, now the, the best-selling books out there right now are self-published. You write your book, you upload it to Amazon, and it's published. Or there's many ways to self-publish, not just Amazon, but that's where I've self-published some books. And, uh, you know, again, in terms of learning, what I always think is don't be in the top 10. That's very stressful. But be in the top 1%. I'll take chess as an example again. There's probably 700 million people in the world who know how to play chess and have played some games in their life. So to be in the top 1% of chess players, you have to be not in the top 10 of the world, you have to be in the top 7 million. And that's good enough <laughs> in most cases to A, achieve mastery, which means you know it well enough that you understand the nuances, you appreciate, you appreciate the subtleties, the science and the art of it. And I'm talking about chess, but it could be any domain. I've been, I've been a stand-up comedian for the past seven years. I'll, I could use that as an example. I've been an investor for the past 20. I could use that as an example. But being in the top 1% not only gives you that appreciation, which comes with a big sense of joy and a sense of mastery and so on, but also being in the top 1% of any field, you can make money at it. The top 1% of, it's very hard to make money podcasting. The top 1% of podcasters make money. There are 2 million podcasters out there. So that's 20,000 is in the top 1%. 20%, uh, 20,000 podcasters do make a living at it. So again, what I tried to say and skip the line is, okay, we're not going to do the 10,000 hour rule, which means maybe you're number one in the world after 10,000 hours. Well, you don't need to do that. And that's going to be a waste of time for most people. Hmm. But using the techniques I write in that book, and I could describe some of them, you will get into the top 1% extremely quickly. And you're right. It's not a shortcut. It's You still have to put in the work. Sure. But again, it's a different metric of judging mastery. No, it's a great point. And the ghost of Oscar Roberto Pano is probably sitting there wondering, hey, maybe I didn't have to play that much chess. Um, but so, but if you're thinking about this, right, um, how do you get good at something that's worth getting good at? I mean, talk about some of those techniques that are in the book, because I mean, I think it's really important for people to understand it because we've all been trained to say, oh, we've, we've just got to be number one. Um, and you're right. I mean, there's a lot to be done in between from here to getting to number one. Right. I mean, look, we're all smart people, or you two guys are, and I'm, I'm faking it very well. I was thrown out of graduate school, so I could always say I'm, I'm <laughs> not smart. But, uh, uh, you know, 
are you number one in the world at something? Like, I don't know. Are you number one in the world at, are you the world dominoes champion or do you play guitar better than Jimmy Page or what's, you know, we're all good at what we love doing, but again, it's, it's mastery is just being in the top 1% will, will, will blow your mind if you're in the top 1% of, of anything that you love. But okay, here's the, the Queen's Gambit. You know that TV show, The Queen's Gambit? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It was out like last October, I think. Sure. Yeah. Well, I hadn't played, I hadn't played in a, I hadn't studied chess in 25 years and I hadn't played in a tournament in 25 years. So, but I loved watching this show and it made me think, you know what? I'd like to get as good as I once was. Cause if you don't practice something for a while, you, you decline. And so I, and I figured, you know what? I'm going to use the techniques I'm writing about and skip the line. So I very rigidly stuck to the techniques and skipped the line. So the first thing I did was, and I call this plus minus equal. I, I found a plus, I found equals and I found a minus. So a plus is a coach or mentor to teach you. And so I, I called around, I, I got one of the best grandmasters out there to teach me for a uh, hundred dollars an hour for per coaching session. Uh, I found equals people who are my level who are striving to improve and they're dedicated to it. And we compare notes and that's online. You could go to any chess site and you'll find your equals. And then I found a minus, which is you don't truly understand something unless you can explain it simply. So I found one or two people to teach and give lessons to. And it's amazing. I learn more from the lessons I give than the lessons yeah. they get often. And it's it's funny. The, the first person I called was the uh, dean of the graduate school, who the guy who actually wrote the letter throwing me out of graduate school. I knew he was interested in chess. So now I'm his teacher for chess <laughs> and he's doing quite well. But I always say to him that I'm learning more than he is in our lessons because it's really fascinating to prepare really complicated uh, concepts in a simple way. And I really benefit a lot from that. Then you divide a skill up into its micro skills. So in tennis, for instance, there's serving, there's, uh, you know, playing back, there's, pl there's playing a forehand, playing a backhand, playing the net, and there's the psychology of winning and losing and so on. For for piano, there's the you know learning uh, you know music theory and scales, chord yep. structures, and and then there's learning how playing the scales and repetition and so on. There's a lot of micro skills. So all of these things you have to develop a training regimen for each micro skill, and some intersection of those micro skills. Getting pretty good at that, that's enough for being in the top one percent. You don't have to be great at every micro skill. And then so there's skills like that I describe throughout the book. And then in terms of monetizing. There's the what I call it. Uh, one approach is what I call the spoken wheel approach. So yeah. I'll I'll use uh, I'll, I'll use stand up comedy as an example. So one spoke might be having a very funny podcast. I know some great comedians who weren't well known until their podcast just shot through the roof. Like uh, if you look up the Tim Dillon show, he's a great he was a great comedian but not well known. His podcast though has like a million subscribers now. And another technique is of course being a great comedian and doing going on tour but that's not the most common technique another one is writing for sitcoms or even writing for the news but ha having a funny take on it or writing books and and or being a comedy coach like there's many ways to make a living from it with with chess i on the one hand i see some streamers making well over a million a year but i'll say for me chess is commonly associated in our culture with you know creativity and intelligence mm -hmm. and I've, I've gotten businesses funded. I actually got into college because of chess. I was a horrible student, but I got into college because of it. Uh, I, I've gotten businesses funded. I've sold businesses because of it because people, and maybe there is some truth to it. Like, you know, with anything that you try to succeed at, whether it's music or chess or tennis or business or sales or investing, it's hard. It's, you're not going to be, it's not about happiness. It's about mastery. Like, like, when you when you are competitive in a game or a sport, you're going to lose about 50 percent of the time if you're progressing up through the ranks. Sure. And that's extremely, extremely unpleasant, particularly because you love that sport. You're, you don't want to lose. If you don't care, you don't care if you lose. But if you love it, you're, you're going to lose and it's going to feel horrible. That's that's why I was a sore loser when I was 17. One time I just I lost and I wet my hand off across the table and all the pieces went on the floor and I ran out. I was a little baby. But uh, <laughs> now you understand on the path to mastery, you understand that losing is the primary way to learn. So 
Wow. And so I, I have in the book, I have something called the, the 10,000 experiment rule. Whatever it is you're passionate about, find little experiments to do so that you, so the nature of an experiment is it's cheap because it might fail. So you don't want to spend too much money or any money on it. It's you have a theory about something and you want to see if the experiment will teach you something about the theory. So it's, and when you have a theory, it means you, there's something either you don't know, or maybe nobody knows. So that's why it's not the traditional path to mastery because you're going to immediately start exploring things. Perhaps nobody knows. I'll give you an example that worked for me, but in stand-up comedy, I wanted to practice my one-liners a little better. So I went on a subway in the New York City subway system, not the friendliest audience for a stand-up comedy. <laughs> and I just started randomly telling jokes. And it was scary. Like, I, I got on there, and I was videotaping it, and I told the person with the camera, forget it. There's no way I could do this. But then she turned on the camera. I started doing it, and it was horrible. But I did it, and I learned. It was an experiment that cost me no money, and I and I pushed through the fear and I learned. And it's really hard. Learning is not about accumulating facts. It's about discovering new things. And that's the fastest way to get to the top 1% of something. So to, to find the unexpected in the field that you love. And again, and then with chess specifically, you know, I there's all sorts of things you learn. Like, okay, let's say you're looking at a chessboard and you find a, a good move and you want to make that move. You always take a pause now. I take a pause. What's, you, once you find a move, find a better move. So think about it from entrepreneurship. You know, you, you have an idea for how, for a market that your product could work in. Okay, that's a good idea. Is there a better market now? Like pushing yourself and being disciplined about your creativity. Oh, you found a creative solution. Now find a more creative solution. That's that's one thing that's dogmatic in chess, but there's many dogma in, in, in every field of life. And it could always be applicable to making money, to career, to entrepreneurship, to sales, to being a good person, uh, to teaching others, and and on and on and on. I love that. I love the honesty. I love the honesty in in your writing, and the advice that you give. It's just again, as I said, radical transparency. Really appreciate your shared wisdom. Thank you so much. Uh, we Thank can't you. Have to, we we got to get you back on. There's not enough time. <laughs> <laughs> it is it. It is it. <laughs> There's so much to unpack because mastery is like a primal thing of being human. It's it's what makes you free ultimately, and it's really mm. you know, that's why I wrote the book. Skip the line under my earlier book. Choose yourself. Yeah. Sure. No, this is awesome. James Altucher, founder of the James Altucher Show. Um, Twitter at J A L T U C H E R. Make sure you get the book. Skip the lines wherever books are sold. Thank you so much for being here. You got a fan, someone that we were on with a show on that I got to get that's texting me right now. I'll give you her contact number. So check in the private chat and uh, we'll see you back in a little bit. So thanks a lot for All being right, on the sure. show. Thank you thanks for being so much, here. Ray. I really appreciate this. And Vala, yeah. thanks so much. Good seeing you again. Thank you, All James. Here. Great. Thank you so much. I highly recommend the podcast, the articles, and his books. Um, He's an uh, in, incredible, incredible mind. Uh, it's our privilege to have Praveen Maturo, Vice President and Chief Enterprise Architect at Mars. Praveen uh, is responsible uh, in his role to drive a digital transformation at Mars. Praveen is an innovative, uh, accomplished business and technology leader, visionary and strategic leadership experience in transformation, technology, and operations, promoting significant business and revenue growth within global and Fortune 500 multinational corporations. You can follow up Praveen on Twitter at P-R-A-V-E-E-N-M-O-T-U-R-U. Welcome Praveen to the Shrek TV. Thank you very much, Vala. I really appreciate it. Uh, Ray, it's always a pleasure to connect with you. You've been a motivator and a provocator, I would say, to drive digital disruption in all our minds. So we always remember you for that. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have Hey, no you. problem. That was fun speaking at the Mars Enterprise Architecture Conference. I thought that was awesome as an industry architecture event. And uh, you got you got everybody there, everyone in the industry. I mean, from fierce competitors to you know partners and other folks, uh, definitely fun being there. Um, I want to talk to you about this field of enterprise architecture, how it actually is affecting digital transformation. And why are all the cool kids doing this? I literally had someone tell my son, like, don't be a programmer. Don't be a coder. That's for other folks. So let's just start there. So, sure, Ray. I think. Uh, what do I tell? Uh, oh boy, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's really a tough question. I think. Uh, let me back up here. I think we all understand the pace of change, um, and the the speed it's taking. 
um so having an architecture mindset and especially when you talk about an enterprise architecture it's it's talking about not architecture but ta- applying architecture to the enterprise and uh giving an introduction of mars is a 40 billion dollar company we have two big businesses uh the human side food cpg and then pet care uh very interesting business very dynamic in nature um i'll start with the uh, a digital consumer and digital customer which is near and dear to all of our heart uh we are working on how can digital really make it easy for consumers and customers to do business with as simple as that it could be looking at their experience journeys and understanding how do we bring digital to their day to day life um especially focus is on b2c and also on b2b because b2b is where the, the the bulk of revenue is there in the past and it will be continuing to having there versus d2c is all the emerging markets and also the emerging new revenue coming in mm-hmm. um with that said in that particular space we are working working very closely on a long on a long term basis uh, on a mac architecture which is uh, microservices api cloud and also headless uh, which is really a, a consume or composable architecture i would call where we can compose multiple solutions um literally talking about microservices a lot of people a lot of discussions on microservices but it's it's much easier to adapt but at the same time it's complex to manage when it grows up so we are working with uh, how do we architect microservices based on business domains business capabilities and also make sure those microservices are sustaining and are scaling and are manageable and looking into docker and all kinds of uh, container based architectures that's you one. guys are, you guys are moving t- typically at mock speed i mean i was talking to one of your colleagues he's saying you're doing like 100 sprints a year i mean that's pretty crazy for your industry right it's probably normal in the uh, software business right but but for your industry that's like probably 10x what people are doing so no uh, it's a great uh, g- great uh, observation ray and uh, the one of the reasons we are also running very comfortably is because we have this enterprise architecture in the back uh, looking at all these efforts ensuring that security scalability and also uh, usability com- compared to all the solutions happening and then how do we zoom in and identify the right solution so quality has been a premium there while we are running at pace um, also that is helping us to scale those solutions these are not like test and learns where we fire and forget or do for small re- regions we are taking what are we are doing and reusing that and purposing it across the enterprise i think that's the value we are bringing big time yeah. um further to go on the commerce we are looking mostly into the social commerce and uh, self service and intelligent bots all that's becoming a norm uh, working on the commerce solutions and capabilities the second interesting concept i would say or a term i would like to introduce is a connected ecosystem so when we are architecting an enterprise we really need to look at our ecosystem not only our enterprise how it is connected with our ecosystem both from outside and in, inside because if you look at mars mars itself is an enterprise of enterprises that's what i would call because um there's business or our specific uh, with pet care is more healthcare and health kind of pet uh, kind of stuff a uh, cpg is more consumer focused and products and manufacturing so two different enterprises that we need to deal across the globe so th- that's the kind of complexity we're dealing with when we apply enterprise architecture so connecting the ecosystem is truly through data and insights and analytics so that's where we are putting a lot of our energy um in terms of data we are looking very good into consumer data platforms how do we uh, segment consumer data how do we help our marketing teams uh, how do we bring consumer data to a single platform kind of an approach uh, also starting with security consumer identity how do we treat consumer identity and consumer identity and access management has been a critical pillar um that has been really helping us to really look into our ai and ml ops and then see how we automate and how we standardize and mature more as we're going into leveraging data uh, to put the best act, best uh, results to our consumer the last one which is near and dear to my heart especially is digital supply chain so there's so much of things are happening in there including digital twins iot uh, automation uh, in, including it and ot the operation technology and it implement technology coming together at the plant level uh, to bring those data and uh, value streams and connect the dots that's been huge uh, and the, the the most interesting part in that is we are building like a lot of control towers which can really be the control tower to connect the dots of the data uh, also looking into um, mostly uh, making this data actionable and insights mm. uh, from the edge perspective also not only take all the data into the cloud and do it but also what can we do at the edge and become more efficient in that space so that uh, 
we can improve our uh, employee efficiency or associate efficiency at the edge as well. So those are some of the things that we are working on from architecture point of view. So there's so many things, but uh, it's all connecting the dots with the purpose in mind. That's it's remarkable to to um, what an immense amount of uh, privilege and and opportunity for you and your company to to transform. I mean, we talked about headless architecture, microservices, ML and bots and <laughs> social commerce in, in just the last few minutes. So many big topics that may have been a 2022, 23, 25 transformation roadmap item, but I, I suspect due to the pandemic and the fact that the world went decentralized and digital only for many, many months and now digital first, a lot of these items may have been pulled in and so you've had this incredible acceleration and sense of urgency around transformation, which leads to my question in terms of leadership and leadership style. How has the last 18 months impacted you personally in terms of leading this incredible amount of innovation that's so many abstraction layers and so dimensional from, again, digital twins to ML to IoT to edge computing? I mean, you're innovating across so many dimensions and you're doing it most likely with folks that are at home <laughs> or are, are, are and connected <clears throat> virtually. How, what are some lessons you can share with other leaders as you've gone successfully through this pandemic era and still been able to transform Mars at breakneck speed? Uh, excellent question, Walla. I think I would uh, answer this in a two-pointer uh, two approach. One, I would, I would give a lot of focus um, one, I would give a lot of focus on problem definition, mm -hmm. and I would come back to understanding what's problem definition. And the second one is empowerment. Those are, those are the two things I would start with. So first one on the problem definition, uh, we at Mars are lucky to adapt a design thinking approach uh, three years ago. And uh, this has been truly put as a user centricity group, um, putting the stakeholder, the customer, the consumer, and uh, uh, the, the stakeholder in the center of the problem and define the problem from a from a stakeholder perspective. This has been very important and this has been not practiced well in the past in my career or in outside, I, I, I can tell you from my experience. So as we are defining the problem from a consumer centric, customer centric, stakeholder centric point of view, that itself is a big major step to define what is the what is it you're trying to solve and how that it bring value to that consumer point of view and for that, we put experience journeys, we put, uh, we put capability maps, we understand how, how does this work. And this happens by interviewing the consumers, customers, interviewing the people who are really uh, impacted during this process. So that firsthand feedback, that collaboration and zero distance to our customers and the stakeholders has been critical. Critical, I would say it's very uh, pillar for our transformation success, I would call. Um, so that really, is uh, doing two things. One is it's putting the stakeholder into the equation. So we are already partnering as, a, as one cohesive team. The second one, it is also helping us to understand how do we see the North Star? What is the MVP approach and how do we bring it into pieces so that we can march towards a true transformation approach? So that's, that's given. The second one is empowerment. As you rightly said, there are so many things happening both from a business transformation initiatives in terms of supply chain, finance, HR, manufacturing, all of these areas. Also, bottom up is technology transformation, right? So there's so many technologies coming and how do we plug them and play them and make sure that they are scalable, secure, and make sure that we are investing in the right technology. So for that challenge, we, we are empowering a lot of our Martians, our associates, uh, by yeah. enabling them with digital training, by also making sure that they are coming together as a, I would say, boundaryless teams, seriously, because uh, uh, the leadership is all about bringing the teams together and helping the teams to to take some uh, ownership and drive with accountability. And that empowerment is really in the culture of Mars. So those are the two key pillars I would call how we are managing this large transformation successfully, uh, yet uh, investing for future. Tremendous. Yeah. I, I love the training. I love the empowerment. Uh, any investment you make in the, as you said, Martians is an investment in the customer experience. So. Terrific, terrific. 
Yeah, and one of the things that's, I mean, I think really important is, is seeing the bigger picture, right? A lot of times, uh, you know, organizations are doing their things in little fiefdoms, little divisions, nothing's being pulled together, right? And it's it's tough, right? Because you're all rowing in different sp spots, you're rowing against each other, you want to all row in the same direction. And that's what a lot of folks aren't able to do. Um, Talk about a little bit of like how you got into enterprise architecture. I mean, like you know, there weren't courses for enterprise architecture back in the day. They're just like there, there's not going to be job descriptions for jobs, you know, 20 years from now that are they're different. But but it's it's like a, it's one of the top fields. I mean, McKinsey's like hiring tons of enterprise architects all over the place. I mean, that's probably one of their top hires out there as well, along with public health people for a strange reason. But yeah, so good question, Ray. Thanks for asking me. I think uh, uh, I think there are very few more few people that uh, really. Uh, are enjoying enterprise architecture and making it put to action and very few enterprises that are really leveraging enterprise architecture to really success. Um, for me, I would say um, it's, it's, it's all about, as you rightly said, thinking the big picture and end to end. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then, and then not just staying at the big picture end to end, but also showing it practically zooming in to say what's more tactical, what's more midterm and what more strategic. I think mm -hmm. Having that mindset is important because delivering the value and living for the purpose or the, for the outcome is very important, right? As a, as a, as we as we look at the enterprise. Now, um, primarily there are a lot of architects in the in the world. Don't take me wrong, and everybody is an architect with have a mindset. That's all I believe in. So they are technology architects, they are application architects, they are integration architects, or any any digital platform architects you call up. But when you truly look at an enterprise architect, what differentiates uh, an individual architect from enterprise architect is taking that structured approach from an end-to-end -end perspective. You have the framework or you have a structured mindset of starting with the business architecture, uh, which includes, of course, the design thinking and putting the consumer and stakeholder viewpoint. But most importantly, looking at the business strategy, the organization's goals, the metrics, and the tactics, how the business, what are the value drivers for the business, and also looking at the capabilities to understand what capabilities uh, at what levels should be addressed. Then looking at the value stream and end-to-end -end model, right? Because this is where I think a lot of people will, will have blind spots. Um, people would be very much stovepiped or focused on one solution to deliver, but they don't understand the impact across, okay, if you do supply chain automation, is it impacting downstream logistics? Is it impacting upstream planning, right? So those are the kinds of things we need to look at from end-to-end -end perspective. That's what we call it as a value stream or a value chain kind of a modeling. Then looking into information and data, it's very critical. As you rightly said, there's a lot of data, a lot of information. There's not, <laughs> not uh, any gap for that. But uh, taking a domain-centric approach and understanding the governance and the compliance and the data flow and uh, um, the actual data value stream is very important also. That's something that people are sharpening their pencils left and right. As you know, we have rightly invested a lot in ML, AI and data kind of uh, projects, but the return on investments are coming in a, in, a, in, a, in a, not in a consistent way. The reason being, we need to focus on insights and purpose, what we are trying to solve rather than That's looking into point. volumes of data, right? So I think having that is important and also putting like a data services, data mesh concept and associated with domains and how do we provision and govern data. So that we have, we are really putting value to data is important from a data architecture. Then we move into application architecture, how you're building your applications, you're building them, you're of custom or you're buying them. Uh, what, what kind of a uh, hybrid uh, application architecture you're looking at, which includes, uh, of course, into integrations and so other details. Then moving into the technology architecture, what are these technologies? What is the support model? Is our organization ready to consume them? Do you have enough capacity? All that kind of stuff. And lastly, the security architecture. Actually, security architecture should be the first one, but I'm just giving you a sequence there. So having all this into a, a mix of thinking, because everybody you talk to can be architecture mindset, but they can only architect from a solution point of view mm. or one of these domains. But a true enterprise architecture uh, and architecture teams looks at these stacks from end to end and make sure the decisions we are making uh, are not impacting the overall enterprise and how they can be readily consumed and put to value. So you that's know. the big picture of enterprise architecture, why it's needed and why it is successful. You've um, been some really, really good points. I mean, and, and as everyone's looking at analytics, automation, and AI and how to get there. Yeah. I mean, this is going to be important. I just want to remember, what was Mock again? Microservices, API Cloud, what was H? Just so everyone knows. Headless architecture. 
headless. headless. There yeah. you go. Headless right? That's, that's the, the most okay. important things for people that look at because those are the big trends. This is the mock approach. Go mock speed. I think you probably make a lot of fun of these things, uh, but we're <laughs> definitely seeing this. Praveen, this is so good, so insightful. insightful. Praveen Moturu, Vice President, Chief Enterprise Architect at Mars. And more importantly, you can follow him at Twitter at Praveen Moturu, M-O-T-O-R-U. Uh, and we'll see you at Constellations Connected Enterprise, October 25th through 28th. So thanks so much for being okay. on the show. Pleasure. Be here. Thank you, sir. Terrific. Awesome. Just mock, you, man. I'm going to remember mock. That's the way to go. So Listen to the list of innovation projects that he's uh, managing. It's, it's just remarkable. It's a small number there, you know, like 100 <laughs> sprints a year. For a multi-billion yeah. dollar company. Okay. Our final two guests. This is what we call up the cleanup hitter spot where we have our best guests come and hit a grand slam. So let me go through the intros quickly because we have so much to talk about. The growth triple play. This is, this is a really awesome topic. Brian Solis, Global Innovation Evangelist at Salesforce. Brian's an award-winning eight-time best-selling author and keynote speaker for about 30 years. So he started when he was five. Brian has studied and influenced the effects of emerging technologies on business and society. Brian has earned a loyal online following of over 700,000 people. I think that number needs to be updated. I think it's close to a million now. He's a co-founder of a weekly podcast called Intersections. Amazing, must listen to, and a terrific follow. Someone I've been following for a decade on Twitter at Brian Solis, B-R-I-A-N-S-O-L-I-S. Welcome, Brian, to Disrupt TV. And our next guest, Biliana Svetnovsky, is partner based in McKinsey and Company in London, office and leads the McKinsey marketing and sales practice for the UK and Ireland. With almost 20 years of experience, Biliana's passion is helping companies deliver sustainable growth and transformation through marketing. In particular, she focuses on innovative approaches in marketing investments, capabilities, and operating models that accelerate impact. Biliana has been published everywhere extensively on growth and marketing, uh, and so incredibly uh, accessible, uh, sharing her knowledge throughout the world. Uh, welcome, Biliana, to Disrupt TV. Thank you, Val. Thank you, Ray. Hey, welcome. I mean, you're the architect behind the McKinsey CXO growth research uh, that you guys put out earlier, the growth triple play. That's why we're here. Um, let's start with let's start with it. Tell us about a little bit what it's about, how the research came about and what was something surprising that came out of that research? Absolutely. So I'll start with the context of how the research came about. Um, so as we know, we've been living in incredible disruption in the last 18 months, lots of change, lots of transformation. But one of the things we we're hearing from executives was quite consistent. They were still asking the question around how can we deliver growth in these new, what they were calling no normal times, given all this disruption. And we at McKinsey and Company have been running research for a number of years around the topic of growth. So what are the capabilities to deliver on growth? How to achieve a part above peer growth? And what specifically are the capabilities within marketing and the role of the chief marketing officer to deliver on growth? So with COVID-19, first and foremost, being a humanitarian crisis uh, with lives lost and livelihoods upended, um, we also saw this incredible sea change of disruption. And we've all heard the statistics in their various forms uh, in, in various channels. So we saw almost 10 years of digital disruption in the first 100 days of the pandemic. Uh, wow. We hear about the loyalty being disrupted, you know, three out of every four consumers changing the brands, the products they buy and the way they buy them. And this is not just a B2C issue. We saw in B2B that there's a rapid acceleration towards omnichannel. So there's been a lot of change. And what we wanted to do was commission research to understand what's different. And so we talked to around 900 executives from around the world, different size companies, different industries, um, to really get to the core of what was different in delivering on growth. And to talk to some of the insights, um, uh, some of the most interesting insights, uh, the first uh, was that 78% of CEOs are leaning into their chief marketing officer to deliver on the growth agenda not only deliver it, but also help define it. And this is quite interesting because we saw this hold consistent both pre-pandemic and during 2019 and 2020. So even in the height of disruption, CEOs were leaning into their CMOs to help them deliver on growth. The second element was this growth triple play. We found that companies that were delivering on a combination of creativity, analytics, and purpose, they were outgrowing their peers by a multiple of about two to three times. And we found that this held true in 2019, that there was accelerated growth for companies who focused in on the growth triple play in 2020. And we found the effect was also cumulative. 
So the more you do, the more you grow. So companies that were doing just one element of the growth triple play, they were growing at, on average across industries around 6%, and this rose to up to 12%. So we're seeing quite a steep incline in the growth trajectory. Maybe the most striking insight of all is that even though these ideas of creativity, analytics, and purpose, they're not new, um, we found that only 7% of companies were able to deliver on all three which is quite an insight. So it's really, really difficult to get to this growth triple play. I might also ask Brian, who was a collaborator on our research, maybe what were the most sort of significant insights um, for you, Brian? Well, I was a big, a big fan of this research the moment that you introduced it and really proud to have been part of this. We launched it at, uh, at Cannes uh, over, over the summer. And the thing that I, I found most fascinated by it was the link of these three disciplines directly to growth. I think the number was growing at 2x uh, over competitors. And that's a pretty substantial uh, ROI. Wow. Uh, and I think you know, what, what we find uh, so often is that you know, companies get caught up in the, in, in the legacy processes and mindsets of what defines strategy and then also what defines success. And as Beliana has shared, you know, this, this last uh, 18 months has proven that uh, the world is on a new trajectory and as such, there is no playbook. So research like the growth triple play are essentially accelerators to uh, new outcomes by embracing new mindsets. And the fact that the, re the research actually lays out not only what's happening with this elite 7% group, but also how to get there. Uh, and these three disciplines are essentially saying marketing needs to have a new role within the organization. It can't just be, you know, linked back to traditional branding and promotion and brand style guides that we have to link purpose in this new world directly to something that matters to customers and markets uh, and that we have to bring those analytics uh, toward meaningful insights that connect the dots to purpose and look i'll just throw out some other complementary stats and this is one of the reasons why i was just so drawn to this research was that even in our own research at salesforce we found that it, Trust was the number one transformation that customers wanted to see from businesses. We saw that 62, 63% of elite marketers uh, own customer experience within the organization and that they share a shared CRM system with service and sales, which means that they're trying to organize around the customer. Uh, and in a conversation I had with uh, Seth Godin uh, earlier this year, you know, I, I asked him, I said, hey, so who, who do you think should own customer experience within the organization? And he said, the CMO. And if the CMO doesn't uh, own customer experience, then they shouldn't be the CMO. And I don't know how to put it any clearer than that. Wow. And so the uh, the idea then, in you know, just kind of wrap up this thought, is that Biliana's research shows the path toward making marketing directly linked to customer experience, which then directly links to growth, uh, which is a business outcome I think every business would like. Uh, and now it's really putting it on, putting the onus on the CMO to say, hey, this is your, this is your shot. Uh, and let's go reimagine your role uh, because this is, uh, this is your time. Wow. So uh, headline for me is, 93% of companies fail to unify creativity, analytics, and purpose. So uh, it's massive uh, percentage of population are not able to do this. And when I think about creativity, I think about a safe place to experiment uh, because that's really the only way you can reach your full potential in terms of creativity. And it was Seth Golden who said, people aren't afraid of failure, they're afraid of blame. Yes. So. I want, I want to ask you, because Brian, you, both you and Biliana talk to customers every day, CXOs every day. What is holding these 93 out of 100 companies from unifying? What's the hardest uh, lever here? Is it creativity? Is it analytics? Is it purpose? And does it all really come back to culture? Because if you don't have a culture of, of trust uh, and a culture where you don't blame people as they experiment and try to find better ways... And it's what James Altucher said at the beginning, really facing your fears, which is, I think, what you need in order to be creative. What's holding these companies back most? Is it creativity? Is it analytics or purpose? Oh, Biliana, that's, that's all you. 
<laughs> You're too generous. Um, so to come back to that 93% versus 7%, so it's difficult but not impossible. Uh, so we, we emphasize that the time to start on the journey, if you're not already on that journey on that ladder, is to, to start now. But it's a great question because it's a combination, Vala, of both what you do and how you do it. And we found that it's a, you know, growth triple play companies were doing three things really well. They were infusing the analytics into their creativity. So they have a 360 degree view of their customer. They have real time analytics. They're infusing it with um, really granular insights into demographics, how you shop, where you shop, what you don't like, and then using creative, uh, uh, dynamic content and creative models to really get the messages out quickly. But they're also infusing analytics with purpose. So they're making sure that there's intentionality and authenticity in every single communication that they have with their consumers or their customers. And, and maybe the newest addition to this um, uh, is purpose. And it's really about making purpose your guiding light and really guiding the organization in every action and every day. And to your point on culture, it, you can't give lip service to, to purpose. You know, um, you, you, people see straight through your customers, consumers, your partners, your vendors, your suppliers. So you really have to um, think about how you really embed it in your day to day. And just to give an example of what we've seen, you know, some organizations, it's not just what they're doing, it's what they're not doing. And we saw that growth triple play companies are three times more likely to retire brands, legacy brands, legacy products, if they were no longer supporting their purpose. And we saw that they were doing other things uh, in terms of the how they execute. So we found that growth triple play companies, they were putting the CMO front and center, as, as Brian was uh, saying earlier, to really drive the agenda and lead at the front to rally people around purpose as a unifier. Uh, they're also moving very quickly and they're learning organizations because the thing about the growth triple play is it's not a one and done situation. You have to keep refreshing your capability, looking at yourself, keep asking the question of, does this support our purpose? Does this help us become, um, you know, de deliver on growth and become the organization we want to be? Uh, and maybe some of the less exciting stuff, you need to have the infrastructure in place. So things like the guardrails and the guidelines, because you can't look at what's happening in every part of the organization. But if you set up the guardrails for growth and say, you know, this is the parameters you can work within and these are the kind of initiatives that you can go after, you have much more opportunity for organizations and your people to move in a dynamic way, in a fast way and, and do that testing, learning, failing, relearning. That's terrific yeah. insight. No, and as you talk about things. all of this, honestly, I think my company is a triple play company um, because all the elements that you said and how they're interwoven, I see it in action every day. So great insight. Sorry, Ray, go ahead. No, no, this is this is really important, right? I mean, you do need a catalyst for change and a catalyst for growth, right? And that's really, you know, where the marketer can play a role. And traditionally, like we see four types of marketers. People are typically focused on brand, right? Like, who are we? What's going on? We have folks that are really demand gen, really driving, you know, revenue, driving the ability to get to that growth piece. We have people traditionally in the community space, and then we have people traditionally in internal comms. And so the role of the CMO itself is kind of ill-defined traditionally because it really depends on what kind of company, what kind of industries, what kind of were the habits that people have. And now we're actually saying, hey, maybe, I mean, is that a CMO? Is that a chief growth officer? I'll just throw a little fuel to the fire here. Like, what is that? So uh, Brian, Giuliani? I'll, uh, I'm going to dive in uh, on this one because it's, it's, it's a name versus a role. And Agreed. I think what Giuliana and the McKinsey team had found was that essentially whether it's the CMO or the chief growth officer, essentially what we're trying to do is align three very important disciplines toward a business outcome through a path of customer engagement. Uh, and that is customer experience. And so I think where I'd love, I'd love companies to focus is on a couple of things. And I, I want to throw out a, just, just two more stats that are really, really important because what we're essentially trying to do is humanize uh, this engagement and not digitize it. You know, digital is is just a, a means of which to deliver the types of experiences and outcomes that are going to matter in this new world. You know, coming back to purpose, you know, I think a lot of companies just kind of get it caught up with vision statements and not necessarily, you know, what it means to be aligned with someone as their values change. You know, let's not forget that we're living through some crazy times, you know, with a, a pandemic and 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 civil unrest and climate change and miss or disinformation and you, people are looking for light 
you know, through all of this chaos. So purpose is incredible. Uh, and our own research, I think it was our state of the connected customer research found that 61% of customers have already stopped doing business this last year with brands whose values don't align with theirs. Yeah. That's a pretty substantial number. And then if you break it down even further, you know, like Liliana said earlier, about 7% of companies in this world are triple play companies. Uh, so the, obviously there's a lot of room for growth, but if you break it down even further than that, let's look at, uh, I, I helped lead some Harvard business research review, uh, research or review research that came out here recently. In fact, I got I to gotta get to launching that, uh, that found that even just on the analytics side, on the 360, organizing around your customer, only 15% of companies around the world are actually organized that way. So when we start to break down the 7% even more, it's truly an elite, uh, elite form. And then lastly, creativity. You know, we're, we live in a world of AI automation. Uh, this is only going to become more ingratiated in our world. And what, why this matters is that creativity is one of the top warm skills listed by the World Economic Forum uh, as necessary here this later this decade. And if, if we look to the work of uh, my idol, Sir Ken Robinson, he describes yeah. creativity uh, as the process of having original ideas and, and, and those original ideas having value. Uh, and then that is that creativity within work, whether it's the CMO or the CGO, is putting your imagination to work. It's applied imagination. And then innovation is putting new ideas into practice. And last, I got to quote Steve Jobs. You know, some people say, <laughs> you know, give the customers what they want. Uh, but our job is to figure out what they're going to want before they do. And so all of these things tie into the possibility, the art of the possibility around the growth triple play. Hmm. I love that. I love I love the reference to warm skills. That's that's uh, that's how Kai, Kai for Lee's book uh, AI twenty forty one. He distinguishes between warm skills and how important it is. Okay, take us to the future. Take us to a couple of years from now, Brian. You just wrote an article about we should be thinking like it's twenty thirty as we you know uh, deliver capabilities and organize around purpose creativity. Twenty thirty. Uh, we're going to be in the metaverse. Yeah, a metaverse. Oh, new metaverse is going to make coming it. In. So. <laughs> but yeah, you, you actually thought you were talking to Brian, but yeah, I'm actually that's right. that's the Brian right. bot. Just a, it's the Brian just bot. ML powered avatar. Uh, what can we expect? What are some of the trends that we're going to be talking about? Let's say next year, 2022. Let's uh, give it to Billy. Billy we'll that's, we'll that's her. <laughs> <laughs> the main one that comes to mind for me is um, given the, the state of disruption and, and what we've been observing the last uh, 18 months or so, I think it's increasingly important to develop emotional and deeper connections with consumers and customers. Uh, that's a big one for me. Uh, and I think that it doesn't stop there. I think that um, organizations should also be thinking about how to develop that connectivity within their own uh, organization. So making employees feel um, um, more close to the purpose and helping you know, live and breathe that purpose. Not only current employees, but you know, future employees. Uh, also thinking about the ecosystem. So really about developing these deeper relationships that are anchored in purpose. And from the research that we ran on the Growth Triple Play, um, it became really clear that if you do look at this sort of very in, uh, impactful and connected growth, holistic growth, uh, focusing as purpose underpinning creativity and analytics, you can actually weather quite significant disruption. And maybe one other thought is keep focusing on these learning organizations. So I, I mentioned earlier, it's not a one and done, but keep thinking about how can you refresh? How can you push forward? Um, how can you deliver growth in different ways and new and innovative ways? I'll throw over to you, Brian. Awesome. That's awesome. Uh, let's see if I can add anything. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was pretty <laughs> robust, Brian. It was very yeah. robust. Uh, hurry, hurry, hurry. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think the idea of you know, bringing it back to your point, Vala, is 2030, is it's that we, uh, we're not going back to 2020. And yeah. that, that acceleration that we're all talking about is really also one about mindsets. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what we don't want to use, is, for example, is insights as confirmation bias. I think what we want to do is use insights as an opportunity to see new possibilities, to create new, to, to, to use data and creativity as a, mm -hmm. as a canvas for reimagining uh, all of the things that couldn't have happened without this pandemic. Uh, and I think that good old fashioned saying, like, think like a startup. Really, I think in these times, what it means is 
your these are th this isn't a cost center you know this is an investment in better experiences that have better business outcomes uh so sure it's going to cost but it is going to turn around essentially like a startup uh you're creating new markets uh based on new experiences that change behaviors and that change market trajectory uh and the way that startups uh, monitor their, those investments and justify them to investors who aren't just looking for one or two X, they're looking for a hundred or a thousand X on those returns, uh, demonstrate every single day that it's possible to do that with these new mindsets. Awesome. This is great stuff. I hope people seize the moment, as you guys say in the uh, report. Uh, this is very important. Um, I'm not sure what's normal going forward, but we can definitely see the difference between the winners and the losers. And I think that's the most interesting piece. And as people figure out what, what that means to lead and unify folks, um, I think purpose is going to be different. Uh, we think that uh, people have different motives on purpose. Uh, and, and I think you'll see alliances built around purpose, uh, which span across industries that span across value chains that span across data sets right i mean especially when we're actually competing for a world of data supremacy um we're going to see you know alliances form not in the same way like you guys talk about uh, and the quote i really love the most is you know form alliances not partnerships um that's how you lead right partnerships aren't going to get you there that's just not enough and we're going to see this happen in all different types of industries that's what makes this really important and i really hope everyone gets a chance to read the report uh read the research so uh, anything else on your end, Bala? No, I'm I'm going to rewatch this show because Ileana and Brian dropped so much nuggets of wisdom that my my brain hurts right now. <laughs> so no, it was it was incredible, incredible. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Biliana. This is awesome. You can follow Brian at Brian Solis S O L I S, and you can follow Biliana's company at McKinsey. So not. I think it's a household name now, but everybody knows McKinsey. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for sharing uh, the growth triple play and more importantly, catch it on the McKinsey site. .com. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Friday. We'll see you in the green room. Whoa, what's going on? <laughs> Is you know, that over? Uh, Are we done in an hour again? Like, how does that happen? Five, um, sorry, four extraordinary guests. Uh, and, you know, from skipping the line to enterprise architecture, to really understanding the importance of the combinatorial effect of purpose, creativity, and data. It's, uh, you know, we could have talked to all four guests individually for an hour. So uh, it's, it's amazing how time flies. That was episode 252. And Ray, we have interviewed so far 772 guests, in case you were wondering. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> next week is episode 253. We have Colleen McGuire, co-founder, CEO of Silver Femme Healthcare. We have Aaron Meary, exceptional technologist. He's the chief digital information officer at Dell Medical Center. I think he's left for Baptist. I think he's left Dell Medical Center. Yes, as I read he's that. At Baptist, I believe. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, Dr. Gita Nair, who's the executive medical director at Salesforce. And she's, Ooh, she's going to be a well. keynote uh, fireside chat at uh, Constellation Connected Enterprise. Extraordinary mind. She really is. Okay, your closing remarks on uh, four amazing minds that we had on episode 252. <laughs> I think you summarized it best, but I think what we're seeing right now is um, people are learning different mindsets. They're learning to think differently. Um, I think what James shared with us was really important, uh, helping people uh, realize that they can achieve their dreams uh, and there's a path and a way to get there. Uh, for folks that are building in the enterprise architecture world, that's super important. Um, speed and agility are key, but I think when we put it all together in the you know growth triple play, or the, uh, you, you can actually see how this all comes together with the need to get the humans uh, resources and our skill sets up to speed to be able to compete our technology in place uh, but aligning that with purpose and i think that uh, pulls it all together so very very exciting episode hope people get a chance to re watch it again and of course uh, we've moved fully off periscope live we're now on twitter live so we'll see how this works and hopefully uh, please let us know your feedback um, anything on your end vala Looking forward to attending your conference. And uh, I want to thank our viewers for tuning in every week. This is Ray and I's favorite time of the week. And uh, it's special because of our guests and the folks that tune in and give us feedback. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot. If it's Friday, it's Disrupt TV, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. You can catch us on most Fridays. And of course, catch us on replays on anywhere where podcasts and videos are. So follow us on at Disrupt TV Show and follow Bala at Bala Afshar and myself at RWAMG0. Thanks a lot and have a great Friday. Bye.